Hey everyone, it's Blake. Welcome in to episode number 42 of our WWE 2021 save in TW 2020. This is SmackDown for week four in September. And uh, of course, on the Raw side, we've got Unforgiven coming up uh, here as we'll do our Unforgiven preview in the next episode. And then we will have the Unforgiven pay per view. Uh, but on SmackDown, we are continuing the build to No Mercy, which will be the uh, SmackDown branded pay per view in October. Uh, so let's jump right in because there's a lot to get to. On this edition of SmackDown, don't know if this will will match our our record setting SmackDown from the previous week, which was easily our best show in the series thus far. But uh, we will see what we get out of this one in particular. We start with the pre-show. It is Jeff Hardy and our Truth getting a win in tag team action over Jinder Mahal and Elias. Uh, Jeff pinning Elias there, 58 overall. Jeff carried the match uh, with terms of in ring performance. No surprise there. Uh, so we uh, have a nice little tag team match here, and this won't be the last we hear of Jeff Hardy on this particular episode of SmackDown. But uh, nice little pre-show gets these four involved. Uh, they've been regulars in our series, of course, but they haven't really done a whole lot outside of uh, Jeff did get his championship match against uh, Roman Reigns. Didn't work, work out too well, but um, yeah, these are just you know people we have on the roster right now that are in different spots, and uh, we're using them uh, in just different kind of ways, but. Uh, not really a whole lot storyline-wise going on just yet, but like I said, Jeff Hardy will uh, be involved in something a little bit later on this episode. And we start SmackDown off for the third straight week at the table, with the head of the table, which is Roman Reigns. Um, he wants to know, of course, the 90 overall here, we know what we're getting. I mean, just this is what we expect now from Roman and the Usos, really. They've, they've been great in these, but uh, Reigns wants to know. He's not happy. He got the rock bottom last week from uh, The Rock. He almost got cashed in on by Seth Rollins. And even though he defended his championship against Damian Priest, it was not you know, a great end to SmackDown for Roman Reigns. And he wants to know, where were the Usos? All this happening, where he gets a rock bottom, Rollins tries to cash in, where were the Usos? And they tried to explain, well, you know, it all happened pretty quickly. It happened within a span of about a minute or two. Uh, that sequence there that, that ended the show. And Rain says, that's an excuse. He says, these two were probably off losing another match like they've been over the past couple of weeks because they just keep losing and he cannot figure out what they're doing. Why are they not winning their matches? John Cena has beaten both of them in consecutive weeks. They've lost their tag team championships. He wants to know. What else does he have to do to tell them that if they don't turn things around and they don't start winning, they can't be part of his family? Like, that's the deal. He owns the family, and he's going to show that uh, here when he has to. He has something to say later on in the episode. He's got something to say to The Rock. But for now, he tells the Usos that if they want to stay in the family, if they ever even want to be at the table, they're never going to be the head of the table. But if they even want to be at the table... They better find a way to start winning matches. So we'll see. The Usos are in action tonight in a six-man tag team match. Uh, but Roman Reigns continues to not be very happy with the Usos. And he's not very happy, period, based on how things ended last week on SmackDown. So we will see Roman a little bit later on uh, to see what he has to say for The Rock. And then we start things off with uh, a very quick match. Drew McIntyre gets the win over Humberto Carrillo here. Uh, 520, not a long match at all. 63 uh, rating here. Uh, with this, You're going to see this on this episode. This is one of those, which I've pointed out before. This is not an episode that's really based around big matches. Whereas last week, you know, we had a couple of them. Uh, of course, our main event really delivered uh, with our best match in the series thus far. But... This is kind of a, a very angle-heavy show, building on storylines and such. Uh, you know how this works now. <laughs> if you guys have followed this, you, you know how this works. So it's kind of an ebb and a flow. Uh, some weeks you'll have more match focus, some weeks are more storyline focus. But uh, Drew, off his game here, even though he shines in the match, um, 63 overall. This again for the second week, a row, week in a row. So we're just squash match from Drew. Comes out, not a lot of emotion. Walks into the ring and just for five minutes and 20 seconds basically just destroys Humberto Carrillo. Of course, we know the difference is last week, um, Drew McIntyre beat up a heel. This week, he beats up a face. Um, what does that mean for Drew McIntyre moving forward? We'll start to dissect that a little bit more 
on next week's episode of SmackDown. Uh, that's where I think you'll start to see. I know there are a lot of questions, a lot of mystery surrounding what we're doing with Drew here, but you'll start to see things uh, sort of build out next week uh, as to where we're headed with this whole thing. But once again, Drew, after that loss to Bray Wyatt, has said he's had to rethink some things. He's been very stoic, very emotionless, um, and we'll see what's going to be next for this. Again, 63, we were just willing to take a bad match rating here. Um, just knowing that we're trying to sort of uh, get from point A to point B. That's the that's the goal with Drew right now. And speaking of, uh, coming off of the Bray Wyatt stuff, uh, it is Bray Wyatt's uh, um, cutting a promo here, hyping a match he's going to have next week with Jeff Hardy. So it will be Bray Wyatt versus Jeff Hardy next week. And, of course, Bray's big thing has been bringing out the dark side. He thinks he's done that with Drew McIntyre. And now he says he absolutely knows that Jeff Hardy has a dark side. He says everyone knows that Jeff Hardy has a dark side, and he's going to bring that out on SmackDown next week. So a 73 overall, not Bray's best promo, but because we did put it um, in the angle here where Bray was rated on entertainment, Jeff was rated on overness, um, you know, we did sort of the standard hyping a one-on-one, uh, you know, angle there, and that's why it wasn't as over as you'll usually get if we just had Bray by himself, which those at this point usually reach about a 90 or higher. So, um, yeah, that was just, you know, one of those things that we just decided to do, use it that way. And uh, Bray comes out looking good, as always. So, uh, sets it up for next week, Bray Wyatt versus Jeff Hardy. And then Apollo Crews is back uh, after losing that Intercontinental Championship rematch to Keith Lee a couple weeks ago. He's back here and actually gets a pretty good segment rating, 77. Not bad here, uh, as that's probably, I mean, like, that's very good for Apollo. I, that's, um, I think he's, you know, like a 60s rating probably overall. Mix, probably low 70s, maybe upper 60s. So this actually worked out pretty well. Uh, Apollo says he wants a second Intercontinental title rematch. He's, he's, he's thought about it for a couple weeks after that loss to Keith Lee. He thinks he needs another rematch. That's what he wants, and he's here to demand it from Mick Foley. Foley says, all right, uh, that ain't happening, so I'm going to give you Samoa Joe instead. So uh, Apollo Crews comes back, and uh, now he gets a match with Samoa Joe. Let's see how that turns out for Apollo Crews. And it doesn't turn out too well, as it is Samoa Joe getting the win over Apollo Crews, 1435. Um, you know, a 60 rating here, that's a little disappointing with these two, but I think it's, this was kind of a long match, and, and one of the issues with this particular show that I had was there's a lot of angles I needed to fit into the show, and it kind of came at the expense of not having a ton of matches. I think we've got, we're going to have, what, four or five, I think, on this show overall, um, and so we had to put more angles in, and so we had to make the matches a little bit longer to meet that requirement of the product so you know we did we needed it to be whatever it is in that 60 percent range um you know and, and we couldn't go over the you know the threshold of not having enough match time versus angle time and so we had to kind of make some of the matches longer because of that and by the way of course as we saw drew's match against Carrillo, that was only five minutes so it wasn't really helping us a whole lot in a wrestling standpoint so this is probably a little bit longer and my guess is if we look at this here um, you know, so Samoa Joe's declining physical ability and the lack of an associated storyline. So those are the two things that knocked us rating wise. But um, yeah, you know, it's I don't know that I was expecting probably anything higher than a 70 at best. So a 60, eh, a little disappointing. But I guess overall, it's not as bad as maybe we would have expected. But Cruz comes back, unfortunately, takes the loss here, uh, as is Joe continuing uh, his run with another victory uh, now for him. And then um, we get a segment here where uh, Keith Lee last week said that uh, he's ready for, you know, a next group of challengers. Uh, he's already beaten Apollo Crews, and um, he's ready for more challengers. So Otis, who we have not seen Otis in a little while, um, we see Otis confront Keith Lee backstage. He steps up to Keith Lee, uh, and he challenges him for next week. So we got a match next week. It's going to be Keith Lee against Otis, and uh, Keith Lee's going to defend that Intercontinental Championship. So um, this is one of those things, and, you know, a 62 overall, it's, it is what it is, but, you know, I, I think having some of these, you know, many type of feuds that aren't necessarily part of a longer sort of feud and storyline and all that, we're going to have to use some of these, and we've, we've done it before, like on the build to longer pay-per-views, um, and that's kind of the thinking here is, you know, Otis, I know we haven't done a whole lot with him, but it's, you know, if we look at our creative, which we'll do after Unforgiven, we do our state of WWE like, Otis is still considered, like, one of our top prospects, next big things, whichever one it is. So, 
I mean, we're trying to find ways to use him. We haven't been able to really do it thus far in the series, but uh, we're going to put him in there with Keith Lee next week and see what we get uh, in an Intercontinental Championship match. So uh, Keith Lee versus Otis for the IC title uh, next week. And uh, I know there's probably not a lot of suspense with that, but like I said, uh, we are kind of on the road to no mercy and we needed uh, something for next week to kind of catapult what we have planned for Keith Lee uh, at the pay-per-view. So uh, that's our match next week, Keith Lee versus Otis. And then, uh, big stuff coming up here. Uh, it is Bianca Belair calling out Alexa Bliss. We talked about it on the previous episode, by the way, as you can see here. We got the new picture. No worries. Uh, we moved away from the, um, you know, the other sort of Alexa, uh, the possessed one. And this goes this great here. 82 overall. Uh, Bianca Belair said she was going to call out Alexa Bliss this week for a fight. Like, uh, it was on. Like, she was like, here we go. Come on out. Let's fight. And so... Alexa Bliss does come out, and, you know, they're standing there. Alexa is walking down the aisle, and Bianca in the ring, and she's ready. Like, she's ready for a fight, Uh, but Alexa has a microphone, and she says, I know that you want a fight, and so that's exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get a fight, but Alexa says, the difference between me and you is that I'm willing to do bad things to get what I want. And that's exactly what I'm doing tonight, she says. And the other difference between you and me is that I did not come alone. So Bianca starts to look around. Alexa has her attention. And then from out of nowhere, it is Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai jump into the ring. They attack Bianca Belair, leave her down and out. And a 62, not great here, but we we kind of understand when we have the NXT call-ups, um, you know, their overness is not great, but uh, we did want to kind of bring this into the mix here. And this is something we've had planned for a while. Uh, so we'll take the, you know, the 62 overall. I'm okay with that. Uh, but we do have Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai um, coming in, attacking Bianca Belair, seemingly forming a trio here with Alexa Bliss, Raquel Gonzalez, and Dakota Kai, and uh, as you can see from the graphic that I put or the title of this episode, um, I like the I like the Mean Girls name here for this group. We'll see we'll see if it sticks. But um, again, Alexa, we've kind of transitioned her into this you know evil doer doing bad things, not the possessed Alexa and all that. And hey, it kind of fits I think the old school Alexa character. I know it's more of like a goddess thing, but she's willing to do whatever it takes to get what she, get what she wants. And so um, I think this is this is something that I, I, I'm very excited about for the direction we're going to be heading in. And uh, it's funny because had I not had this, you know, very well thought out, very well planned ahead of time, obviously we could have perhaps considered Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai in the spot at Unforgiven now that we've got the Io Shirai injury uh, and needing a team to face uh, Sonya Deville and Shayna Baszler. But instead we still are able to put them in the spot. I just didn't want to change things that much uh, just for that one-off match at a pay-per-view. So um, this is going to help, though, with our, our tag team situation in the women's division, and and not just this. You'll see what I mean, but we got a lot of fun stuff in the works here, I think, moving forward uh, on SmackDown uh, in particular, but also, of course, on Raw when it comes to the, the women's division and, and the direction we're trying to head in uh, with everything. So uh, here you go. These two are now uh, joining forces, seemingly, with Alexa Bliss, and uh, we'll see what that means for Bianca Belair. And then it's Sami Zayn um, hyping a promo ahead of this uh, six-man tag team match he's going to be a part of. He is going to be teaming with the Usos here against John Cena and the Viking Raiders, and Sami points out he takes a conspiracy again because he said he has to team with two human beings in the Usos. Meanwhile, John Cena gets to team with two Vikings. Like, are these guys even real? Um, so Sammy points out that's a conspiracy also, uh, that, uh, he doesn't get to, you know, pick two Vikings as his human beings. Of course, Sammy not realizing that they are also human beings, uh, the Vikings, but, um, that is Sammy pointing out any possible conspiracy he can find, um, heading into this match. And, uh, so it does gain heat here. 75 overall. Good stuff here from Sammy. Um, and I, I'm just excited about this whole thing and you'll, you'll see what I mean here. We still got a couple more segments here moving forward. Let's see what happens in the match. And wow, actually a pretty good match here, 74 overall. Uh, it is Sami Zayn and the Usos getting the win over John Cena and the Viking Raiders. As Sami 
pins Eric of the Viking Raiders with a Luva kick. Uh, Cena, head and shoulders above everyone else. That's no surprise when it comes to the in-ring work. Uh, but uh, Sami Zayn gets a pinfall over Eric. So Sami Zayn's team pins the Viking Raiders, of course. Another note here, which we'll talk more about in the coming weeks. The Usos actually part of a winning team here. So uh, the Usos somewhat get their revenge, perhaps, on John Cena. Uh, so all three of these come out looking much better than they did going into this match. Uh, and we'll see exactly uh, what that means for them moving forward in their own specific storylines. But uh, it is uh, the team of Sami Zayn and the Usos getting a much-needed win here over Cena and the Viking Raiders. Uh, so good match here. We'll take that and much more to come uh, involving this particular group. And uh, it is Damian Priest cutting a backstage promo. 69 overall, nice rating, but Damian Priest struggles going off script. I don't think we usually get that. He's usually pretty good uh, when we have him go off script. So just one of those things that, eh, it is kind of what it is, and there's not a lot we can do about it. But uh, Priest says he came up short in his uh, Universal Championship match against Roman Reigns, but uh, he says it's not the last of him and that uh, he will be back for another match with Roman Reigns in the future. Uh, but uh, Priest saying he's not going to get his head down. Uh, he's going to continue to work because he, he was that close. He felt what it was like to almost be at the top of WWE, and uh, he's going to do everything he can to make sure he gets that opportunity again uh, to prove that uh, he is one of the best out there, and um, that is that is his goal now. So this was obviously, we wanted this to be much better, but the fact that uh, he struggled going off script, that did not help the writing. But uh, that's okay uh, for this one in particular. And then <laughs> that gives Sami Zayn enough time to get to the production truck. Uh, and this is great here, 77, uh, where Sami Zayn is in the production truck telling the person operating uh, the videos and, and all of that uh, and inside the truck to keep replaying the pinfall. So we're seeing this over and over where Sami's just having this guy replaying the entire sequence where he pinned uh, one of the Viking Raiders there. I think it was Eric. Um, and it's just getting replayed over and over again. And now Ali, as he's doing this, he's looking around in the truck and he's telling everyone, all the workers in there, he's saying, did you see what I just did? He said, I just beat John Cena. Um, and Sammy keeps talking about it. He keeps saying, look, watch this right here. And of course, it's him pinning Eric of the Viking Raiders, but um, he's doing the one, two, three. Look, I just beat Cena again. And so this is kind of Sammy playing up this whole uh, sort of delusional element plus the conspiracy, all of that. Uh, factored into it so uh, i'm having fun with the sammy thing right now i think that especially the direction we're going to head in with it i think it's going to be great but um yeah sammy uh just not he's telling everyone he's in the production truck he's running the replays um he beat john cena at least that's what he sees when he uh does the replay so there you go sammy Zayn, another great segment on this uh, episode of smackdown with a 77 overall and uh, Samoa Joe, back again, doing his usual thing here, as uh, he is in the crowd ahead of our main event, uh, which will be two more people I don't think he's been in the crowd for. Uh, he's kind of been all over the place, hasn't he? He's gone from the Intercontinental Championship match, um, our main event last week with Reigns and Priest. Now he's set up uh, for our main event, which is going to be Seth Rollins versus Shinsuke Nakamura, one-on-one -on -one action uh, there in that. So uh, Joe in the audience continuing his theme. We don't know exactly who he's got his eyes on, but uh, Samoa Joe is not backed down from anyone, doesn't back down from a fight, and he's in the audience ready to watch the main event for a second straight week. So 59, not great here, but uh, this was just all based on overness. And I think Joe's around a 60 or so right now. So eh, we'll take it. And uh, speaking of the intercontinental, or excuse me, the, the main event, uh, it is Seth Rollins. Uh, with a promo here, always great, 87 overall. But Rollins' focus is not necessarily on Nakamura right now, as uh, Seth Rollins uh, cuts a promo, and of course it says upcoming match with The Rock. Um, it is basically Seth Rollins blaming The Rock for ruining his opportunity, and Seth says he wants a match with The Rock. Like, he tells The Rock, don't be scared. You just ruined my golden chance to become the universal champion. He had everything planned, everything set out as soon as he saw The Rock come out there and hit that rock bottom. He knew exactly what was about to happen. He was going to become the Universal Champion, and The Rock ruined everything. He ruined it for him. He ruined his big moment, and so Seth tells The Rock, he's ready anytime. He's said, just come on. He wants a match. Like, Seth is just angry. He's not happy at all uh, having his cash-in opportunity uh, blocked last week by The Rock. And so uh, a very angry Seth Rollins heading into the main event, and uh, let's see what happens in our main event. 
which gets a 73, so pretty good here. Um, you know, especially, I think, because with Nakamura, we haven't had a lot of great matches because of uh, the physical ability and all that stuff. But it gets a 73, so we'll take that. And it goes 21 minutes and 27 seconds. This is what I meant about having to make some of these matches longer. So Nakamura is still in a 21-minute match, able to get this. But it is Rollins getting a win in a roll-up situation uh, on this one. Now, we did try to really structure this to help out some of the stuff that have kind of been holding back Nakamura. Uh, so when we look at what our notes were on this, uh, we did make it an open match, called in the ring. They both have good psychology. Um, and we kind of, you know, look at this. We, we banned the spinal impact moves. We tried to really make sure this was going to hit uh, in a very good way. Uh, and, you know, we did sort of the slow build as well. So that kind of helped out, I think, Nakamura in a lot of this. And if we look at the dirt sheet, um, you know, Nakamura, good job of slowly building the match. So that's kind of one of his things that it really worked out very well. Even though he gets knocked, um, you know, for the declining physical ability, he gets the bonus for the slow and steady and all that. So I think we we did a really good job kind of structuring this match. That's kind of my point is that hasn't always been the case with Nakamura matches. They've just been harder to book. Uh, but we tried to go all out on this one, and we still only get a 73, but that's okay. We, we'll, we're we fine with that as, you know, their in-ring performance was not that far off. So um, good stuff here in the main event, but uh, we're not done yet. As uh, after the main event, Seth Rollins starts to make his way up the ramp uh, in celebration, and he runs into Roman Reigns, who starts making his way down the aisle. Seth, both of them walking very slowly towards each other, and uh, Rollins with his Money in the Bank briefcase in his hand. Uh, and then as they start to get closer to each other, Seth and Roman kind of stop. They go face to face. And Roman says he doesn't have the microphone. We can hear it into the camera. Reigns tells Rollins that if he does that again, he will hurt him. And he makes it very clear that if he tries what he tried last week at the end of SmackDown, he will hurt Rollins. And so that is kind of Reigns with a very stern and direct message to Seth Rollins that if he does that one more time, He's going to hurt him. And so that's uh, Rollins just kind of looks at him, walks off. And um, yeah, so that's kind of the tension continues to build between these two, especially based on what happened last week um, at the end of the show. So uh, that is that. But Rollins, besides better of doing anything now, heads on to the back. Reigns makes his way down to the ring. And then he does it again. Roman Reigns, Mr. 100, back once again. And it is Roman Reigns in the ring. And he basically calls out The Rock and tells him that next week, The Rock wants his match with Roman Reigns. Well, before they have that match, if Roman's going to agree to it, The Rock is going to have to agree to his terms. And next week, if The Rock is going to show up, then Roman Reigns will share the terms for the match, the only way he will agree to it is if The Rock agrees to his terms in this big match. So uh, that is another very direct message from Roman Reigns. Not a lot of words here for Rollins or Rock based on what happened last week. Reigns just says, Rock, come, come to SmackDown next week, and I'll give you my terms. If you agree to it, then we'll have our match. That's it. That's the setup. And uh, as usual... Roman Reigns delivers, as always. So, that was SmackDown. Um, again, a very direct Roman Reigns on this episode uh, based on what happened to him in the previous week uh, on SmackDown. So, he didn't have a lot to say uh, on this one, but uh, he made his message very clear to two people in particular, or I guess four people in particular if you go to the Usos. So, Reigns uh, setting his sights on everyone right now <laughs> after what's happened to him. So, uh, we continue the storyline with Roman Reigns. And for this episode of SmackDown... Wow, it gets an 84 overall, so I was not expecting that. I thought that the matches were going to be so bad that it would really bring down our show, but really, I mean, the six-man tag kind of exceeded expectations a little bit as a 74. I didn't think a Nakamura match at this point would be that great, but we did pull out all the stops, like we said, just to try to get that rating up, so it gets to 73. Um, so, once again, another 80. I mean, this is, like, this is, I think, our second best show ever. I, I really believe that. Like, we need to look at the numbers, but... I think this is our second best show. So SmackDown, in back-to-back -back weeks, pulls out an 87 and an 84, but 
Uh, I think a lot of that really, I mean, I think it goes beyond Roman Reigns at this point. Like, Rollins has delivered Sami Zayn segments, really came through on this episode. I mean, he gets a 75, the match gets a 74, 77 for the other one. Um, yeah, like this is, uh, I'm telling you, SmackDown is is in a groove right now. And uh, hopefully the, the Raw curse does not make its way to SmackDown, which, oh, by the way, it did. And I'm about to tell you exactly what I mean by that, because I wanted to save this for the end of the episode, but the Raw curse, it's back, but it's a little bit different this particular time. Let's, let me show you what I'm talking about. Okay, well, before we get to the Paul White retiring news, um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's jump into what I was kind of teasing at here. So if we go to our email, John Moxley signed with New Japan of America, so I assume he's going to work uh, New Japan strong. Drug testing fees, SmackDown, I think that's a 5.55. I think 5.57 was our rating last week, so a little bit lower, but still right there. Kofi's contract's ending. We did that. Now, to the Raw curse coming into SmackDown. <laughs> Again, it's a little bit different, but... Um, so, Jimmy Uso and Naomi have divorced after... Jimmy Uso was caught cheating with Mandy Rose. Now, you would ask, which brand is Mandy Rose on? Well, of course she's on Raw. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so in another way, the Raw curse strikes again, uh, as it is the women's division on Raw, and another particularly newsworthy item here, uh, as Jimmy Uso and Naomi divorcing after Jimmy and Mandy Rose, um, apparently having a fling. Now, if you remember, it's the strangest thing, on YouTube... I pulled up my YouTube and like just I got a random video and it was the video from like a couple years in WWE. I don't really remember this, but it was like Mandy Rose in a hotel room or something waiting on Jimmy Uso. Like, I don't remember the storyline at all, but Naomi comes in and like Naomi and Mandy Rose start fighting. So two years later, long term storytelling right here, folks. But um, it is, you know, noteworthy here (laughs) that this is something else that another raw women's division um, noteworthy news item. Uh, speaking of, that's where we got the hatred. Uh, Aaron Andrews, so that's the former uh, Cameron in WWE. So now um, she hates Mandy Rose. Of course she does. Um, she hates Jimmy Uso, of course. And of course, Naomi and Mandy Rose now hate each other. So, oh boy. So just a lot of chaos right now um, here coming out of this. So, I mean, there you go. So I uh, just, yeah, it's um, it's very interesting. As you see, your Paul White retiring, so um, he's he's done. I don't think we're going to have him back for a retirement tour since he's in AW right now. Um, so yeah, he's in AW, so we won't be having him back for a retirement tour. SmackDown strikes gold. The Godfather retiring. Oh well, we're not going to have the go. We may have maybe they bring the Godfather back. What do you think? Maybe we should bring him back for a nice little show. We'll see. We'll see if there's anything in the works on that. But um, everything else, that's about it for this episode. We do have some stuff waiting here. I don't think that's anything uh, in particularly noteworthy. Uh, I don't want to pull it up, but I can't remember <laughs> exactly if anything is going to be spoiled in there. I don't think so, but it's fine. Kofi, by the way, we did mention Kofi. We already put in the extend Kofi's contract, but there you go. Let's look at our show history, though, because I am kind of curious to know if that was our second best show we've had to this point. And let's see, it's an 84, right? So let's go down the list here. Uh, 83, 87, the SmackDown. Okay, now we're just looking for anything 84 or higher. 83s, 80s. No, I remember like these shows were not good, so we're not going to have it there. Yeah, so there you go. I'm I'm convinced at this point. Well, that's it. So SmackDown, <laughs> two weeks in a row, um, our two best shows. So fantastic. Uh, good stuff for SmackDown, uh, really in a groove right now, and we'll see what comes of that uh, on this. But uh, there you go, there's SmackDown on the next episode will be our Unforgiven preview. I'm trying to sort of figure out the timeline, don't know exactly just yet. I'm thinking Unforgiven preview probably Wednesday or Thursday. If the Unforgiven preview is Wednesday, then I'll probably have Unforgiven up on Friday. If it's on Thursday, it may be Sunday before we do Unforgiven. So, just want to let you guys know on that, but uh, Unforgiven, you will have it this week at some point. Uh, maybe Friday, maybe Sunday, one of the two, and uh, hopefully no more news to talk about with the Raw curse, as uh, after all the injuries, now we've gone to adultery. So, on the next episode, Unforgiven. It's almost here, and uh, what a pay-per-view it should be, and we will preview it on the next episode here in the save.